these intelligence contacts are saying that there is an impending cataclysm and it kind of creates a bifurcation. Welcome back. I'm here again with Dr. Michael Masters. Today, we're going to talk about the recent disclosure hearings and the implications of it. So welcome back, my friend. Thank you. Okay. So the hearings, there were some very clear messages that Grush came, you know, reported. Now, some of the things that he said under oath, he hasn't seen any of this stuff personally, but he's relaying what other people within the intelligence community have told him. Yes. So I want to just under say that's oath. under important, oath, which is under very oath. important. However, it's very easier important. to say so and so told me X when you don't have direct experience because if they lie to you, you didn't lie, right? So I'm not saying that he was lied to. I just want to be very clear about this. But no, I just not wanna... by that many people who have the credentials that that they have. I don't think that's even on Correct. the table. I just want people to be open to the possibility that there may be, I don't want to call it a psyop, but there may be misinformation, disinformation. And I don't, I'm not saying, I'm not saying all of it is because the best misinformation is his manifest function is calling out that psyop and talking about how arrow is still part of the psyop. They're taking things in and not doing Jack all with it. Kirkpatrick's probably a puppet. I mean, that's him saying that he's making these cases in different words, obviously, but we should be looking past that and actually going to the source to try to figure out what's going on, what's been illegally hidden from the public so and Congress. Before we get into that part of it, like, why do you think somebody's still trying to look again? I want to be very clear about where I stand. I think you're an idiot if you think there's nothing going on out there. There's not something, you know, there's not something that is anomalous. People are reporting things that aren't true. Now, are some uh, some of this stuff disinformation, misinformation? Sure. But if those lights in the sky are Chinese or Russian, then no, we're past it's over. that. Yeah, we're yeah, past then it's that. over. I mean, look, I I am more ter- I would be more terrified if that were the case than if it's something something. Why? Else. They seem nice. I, I worked with a lot of Chinese and Russian people. One of my best friends here in Butte's Russian. Well, you you worked with scientists, my friend. You didn't no. work with no, not military? At all. Military? No, I mean, her uncle went helicopter hunting with Putin once, but she's, you know, not political. I only know her because she, you know, married another friend of mine. But yeah, I don't know. I, I think this whole narrative of, with Russia going back, you know, decades beyond the Cold War. And and now with China, it's just, it's a diversion from what's actually going on. We we need to construct the other in some capacity. We do this mm-hmm. in our everyday lives. We've done this throughout history with various groups, ethnic groups, ancestral groups, and we started doing it with nations, even if it's not necessarily valid. Like we're, we're in the height of the Cold War and we start creating the International Space Station and collaborating very tightly with Russian cosmonauts, like circle that square. You know, we need to have this perceived enemy in order to bolster our own patriotism so people still go off and die in the stupid proxy wars that we create with those other nations that we've constructed the other around. But if you look look at the nuances of it, I I think it's probably part of the ruse, to be honest. So The Ruskies. Sorry, I make that little dad joke there. Why do you think at the, like the arrows of the world exist? Like, what do they? What do you think the motivation is? Is not to not to? I mean, literally, all they have to do is say we're not either we're not alone, or right. I can answer that even, question in very simple terms. I think the role of the arrows of this process and of the mainstream media is to keep people comfortable. People don't like having their worldview challenged. It's always been the role of the nightly news to center people, to make sure that they're happy and complacent so they go out and buy products and contribute to the economy and don't disrupt the political system. It's always been what they do. So when we're talking about things that are going to challenge our worldview in such a way that it could disrupt that system, 
Of course, they're not going to talk about it because people turn that news on every night to be validated in their ignorant belief system, this worldview they've constructed around that nightly news throughout the history of their life. So, of course, they're not talking about it. It's normal. You would expect to see that. I think you're far kinder than I am. I think back 75 years ago, people who tried to communicate this were murdered or destroyed, humiliated. And I think in order to kind of keep one lie, I mean, for goodness sake, like Admiral Forrestal jumped 15 f- floors to his death. Why? Right? Yeah. I mean, look at all of the t- stuff happening with psychedelics research and the CIA. No, I'm, I'm not at all saying it's only this thing. For right. God's sakes. This is what we're currently seeing. You asked about Arrow specifically, and I think that same aspect of Arrow extends to the mainstream media. But absolutely. Yeah, no, you have people that have billions of dollars worth of trade secrets that were gifted to them mm-hmm. who have been using that for their own benefit at the expense of the world population and our climate and our environment. And that's that's bullshit. You know, and these people are afraid to be held accountable. People have been killed over this, as you alluded to, and Grush pretty much said in his interview with Ross Colart. So, yeah, there's a lot of illegal things. There's a lot of nefarious, unethical things that have been happening in the process of hiding this that they don't want to come to the surface. I see that as a a separate aspect that's unrelated or loosely related to what's happening with Arrow and the lack of I think of it's driving a lot of their motivations, like people who are the secret holders. Oh, absolutely. Know yeah, that, that multinational some... defense corporations, the military industrial complex, the senators, Congress people who are involved in keeping it hidden for a long time as well, certain presidents, I'm sure. And I think if some of those secrets came out, I think even if you had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it still wouldn't protect them. Well, so, I think they're waiting long enough that those most of those people will be dead or they can wipe their records to where they're not able no, to they're be still found co- too. They're, they're still, still accountable. accountable. They should still be held accountable. They're, they're, but what's what's our what's our frame of reference though? What's our precedent for this? We're talking about entirely unprecedented things that happened that affect the whole of humanity. What else has ever affected the entire human population in such concrete and odd terms? You know, there's no precedent for this. They don't know what to do. They're scrambling to get ahead of it and figure out how they can cover their asses. Because what do you look to? What do you look to in history? This has never happened. It's insane. Analogs, but, you know, the analogs are really negative, right? You look at Cortez arriving in South America. And what happened there, right? In terms of now, a lot of it was disease. The indigenous population could have slaughtered him if he had played his cards in a different way, right? Easily. But yeah, he knew what he was doing. And we use the same tactics. We're using them now. I mean, we used them in Iraq with the the Sunni and the Shia and the Kurds. And it's a divide and conquer strategy. And he also benefited from the fact that he could take out the head of the Aztec empire because they had a well-established hierarchy, establish his colony, his people at the top of that and rule them. And they followed along for a while at least. But yeah, I mean, those are somewhat analogous. I talk about them a lot in my second book as sort of a contact metaphor of sorts, but this is different because it involves (sighs) arguably the same people perpetuating similar things on their own people. You know, you could argue Cortez is Spanish. The Aztecs are indigenous to that region. They're separate people. Who right. There was an otherness. War. Right. There's there was an, an otherness, otherness there. Yeah. Right. Now this otherness, we're talking about a very small group of arguably entrepreneurs, members of the military industrial complex who benefit a very small group. Meanwhile, the entire human population suffers. That's mm-hmm. a very different situation. If that is the case, I'm not saying it is, but... <laughs> More and more every day, we're starting to get a glimpse into what was happening. It does seem to be the case. So there was one cr- congressperson who asked Grush if we had agreements with quote unquote non human intelligences, whatever that means. Okay. And his answer was 
I can't answer that in open he- healing, but I'd be happy to discuss that in the skiff. For yeah, I learned what skiff was today. Was yeah, secret for compartmented information. Right. Yeah, I think I actually facility. watched that part. Like I said, I didn't get a chance to watch it, but somebody sent me that clip because they were talking about the bodies. And it was uh, Ms. Merck or Mech or South Carolina. Ma- Mace? Mace. Mace. Yeah, that was it. Ms. Yeah. Mace, which is kind of a cool Yes, name, it's the it's the it's the one that they interestingly, it's the one that they chose to have on repeat, which tells you something else about the media. And to your point, there is this mad dash to get information out why would that be the piece of information that because well it's also efficient i didn't watch the rest of it but she was like bam 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 yes or no yes or no you 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 and then like it was very well done as uh, an interview or a question asker and she got what she needed moved on to the next one move on and so i could see just from a logistical standpoint why they might use that but yeah she was also asking the most important questions tell me about the bodies are there contracts? Did you know the, these people in forty seven throw the rest of humanity under the bus for personal economic gain? Like, yeah, he's not going to ask that in a public or answer that in a public hearing. But that question's out there now, and we should all be asking it. And if it comes out in a skiff, then that's that's sweet. Hope it does. Well, and the, I mean, this leads to other questions too, because I think our follow up was so many, so many other questions. when. When did this happen? Right. Yeah, so now I guess I can't she, ask. You that. couldn't ask that because he said skiff first. Yeah. It's funny that the On, only like six minutes of this three hour thing I watched were talking about. And coincidentally, I'm glad that happened because I would have to say, I don't know, to every other part of that. So Congressman Luna also asked an intriguing question. A lot of these, some of these questions were just completely like random. One of them was, is it true that commercial pilots have been threatened with restraining orders from private corporations for speaking or for reporting certain instances? And again, yeah, like that's I don't know. Crazy. That sounds kind of informed, actually. I don't know if I all, all their questions that I'm aware of seemed very informed, like they came from closed door mm-hmm. briefings already. That was one of the most mind blowing things, not just that the, it was highly partisan or bipartisan, I guess is the word we use, but that they were asking questions that seemed to indicate they had a deep base of knowledge to build from, which I didn't expect to see. I thought it would be well, like my- uh, aliens. Cool. That's what we're talking about. But it was like, let's get into yeah. this. This is a very specific question to try to get information out about something that the American public needs to know about. I already know about it now because I've been in these closed door hearings. Let's get you saying it in front of other people, or at least the most you can say without breaking the law. Well, they, they've they been having these hearings apparently in secret for the last year, year and a half, two yeah, years. Yeah, a couple of years. So, and uh, apparently there was some huge intelligence meeting they had either earlier this year or sometime last year at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base with all these intelligence officials where they kind of flew them all in and they had some meeting. So- it definitely feels like there is a timeline and we are trying to get now what i'm worried about is that something catastrophic is going to happen in the next 2 years and they just need to get this information out so that to help whoever survives it yeah that was the point of my third book i'm sure i haven't talked about it yet but that was well there's really a great segue entire... to talk about it my friend a yeah. little yeah that was the entire basis for that publication. It's written as a science fiction novel, but done so intentionally to allow for the opportunity to talk about more speculative things like that. Like, what is the reason behind this disclosure? What is the effect of a cataclysm? How does disclosure affect people's understanding of politics, economics, and especially religion? It's very much about what is going to be the impact on religious people if if disclosure happens and they learn a lot of their belief systems were based on something entirely different than what they originally thought they were. So, yeah, I think uh, it's going to be earth shattering regardless, but especially if there is some sort of climate, asteroid, nuclear sort of cataclysm associated with that, which you have heard coming out of certain circles as Frank Milburn and Ross Coulthard have been talking about for almost two years now. Wait, I just interviewed Frank Milburn. What what has he said? About, I didn't even ask him about this. What has he said? Same, about? exact same as Ross. That they're, and I've talked to these people too, given my mm-hmm. interest in publication record regarding the time travel hypothesis that these 
intelligence contexts are saying that there is an impending cataclysm and it kind of creates a bifurcation which is a major theme in this book because it makes a great science fiction story especially when you can tie it in with real things associated with the ufo phenomenon and, and things that have sort of come out of uh upper level macroeconomic classes i've taught over the years and whatnot but the main thing being articulated is that there's these two different groups that the greys need the catastrophe to happen because that's what leads to their civilization why they have those characteristics there's another faction that's trying to stop it from happening because obviously it has a, a huge impact on the population of earth and everything that goes with that our civilization crumbles and whatnot so yeah that's you know they're advocating both frank and ross or at least they had they don't talk about it much anymore. And it's really interesting that you just interviewed Frank and this didn't come up since that was kind of his main thing he was talking about over the previous two years is that they're warning of an impending cataclysm and it has to do with the UFO phenomenon, but competing factions almost in some sort of time war who have different interests with relation to whether the cataclysm happens or doesn't. So just to build on what you're saying, so I've interviewed two remote viewers that you are probably familiar with. So you know Lynn Buchanan, right? I do not. L Y N N one N. Spell it. L Y N. So have you ever so the the men who stare at goats? It does sound familiar. Uh, I, I, again, was that made I think into that a movie meant, with Brad that's Pitt? Exact, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's why it sounds familiar. It wasn't Brad that's, Pitt though? It was George Clooney. George yeah, Clooney. Clooney. I've always gotten them mixed up. His character is based on an amalgam of like three different people. Lynn Buchanan's one of them. Okay. So I think he did a remote viewing project for a major corporation in the late 90s. My guess, based on what Bill Gates did subsequently, and just from context clues and talking to Lynn, because Lynn has never revealed who that corporation is, but he talked about doing some other project where he's looking at a clean room right? Because there was some psychic they brought in that was talking about like medical gear and stuff like that. He's like, it wasn't medical gear. It's just poor remote viewing. It was, and I'm like, was it a was it Ingo Swan? What about Ingo Swan? It, was he the remote viewer? No, no, no. Lynn Buchanan was the remote viewer. Lynn Buchanan was the remote viewer. So he saw a cataclysm or a series of man-made natural disasters that would come to pass between 2020 and 2040. The first, and this is back in late 90s. The first thing mm. he saw was like everybody working from home, like doing this. So I'm not going to parse my words, but COVID was clearly a man made natural disaster, not intentional, I don't think, but based on the evidence that I've seen with eco health. And I think that it was part of a bio defense program to just develop recipes to handle like a SARS virus and it just, you know, they couldn't do escape. it in the US because it was gain of function. Yeah, it was an escape. It was a lab. Yeah, a lab. I mean, that's bound to happen with our tests yeah. and this stuff. Yeah, you should, I mean. You know, it's interesting yeah. too, since we're talking about remote viewing, but a week after my second book came out, I read Joe McMonagall's book, mm -hmm. The Ultimate Time Machine. And on, I think like page 174 or something, talking about remote viewing the future, he says that by the mid 21st century, it will be commonly understood that UFOs are, for lack of a better term, time machines. And I was mm -hmm. like, damn it, why didn't I read that two weeks ago <laughs> to actually be able to put that in my book, you know? So yeah, remote viewers focusing on this time now, between now and that next, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, there seems to be a lot of going on in there they seem to be drawn to that to some respect which i find very interesting and real quick if they're still alive as these things are revealed that also becomes that feedback that feedback loop that they always want as these remote viewers it becomes that precognitive retro causal notion that they eventually see and fulfill that self-existing consistent loop oh, but regardless lynn buchanan said that he saw a decline of three quarters of the human population just gone now whatever that doesn't mean that like they perish in some disaster it could mean that somebody shows up and takes people i i, I don't know right but 
Yeah. He definitely uh, didn't have read, a, Have you read my last deal. book? I have Revelation, not. But I'm definitely going to read future it. Human past. I think you'd enjoy it. It seems to dovetail with a lot of these things we're talking about right now and, and very, various the, themes. The, 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 there's definitely something in the zeitgeist right now. Like there's something I can't explain it, but just even in my own life, stranger and stranger things keep happening. I'll just give you a very quick one morning. I came down, looked at Twitter and I see the name Ted Kaczynski. I'm like, that's really weird. I did. Cause I didn't remember it at first, but I saw the name. I'm like, Oh yeah. I had a like a dream about his philosophy last night. It was just really mm. weird. I click on the link. Ted Kaczynski died today. Like stuff like that. That yeah, you just synchronicities. I mean, but almost precognitive. Like I didn't, I, I wouldn't have said I predicted he was going to die, but like more and more, I'll give you another example. We are talking, you're talking about a science fiction novel. 18 months ago, I sent a, an outline to my publisher because I also write science fiction. And it was about a unit that conducted crash retrievals. Mm. Right. This podcast I started 18 months ago right in time for this I'm trying to think of other really weird examples well uh, we can we can do this offline it's not relevant to but there's i think there's it, a lot it of is people... relevant it's extremely relevant because these things if you are paying attention do give you a glimpse into the future and if we're having these now there's a very good chance if they are reliable and mine i've had precognition my entire life and they've been extremely reliable why why wouldn't that transcend to this moment where we're still having things from our near future or more distant future being interjected into this time period. Now, I I talked to a guy who had a book come out almost identical to mine, with very similar storylines, very different way of writing and characters and everything, published almost the same day. And he reached out to me like, hmm, this is odd. Can you tell me anything about where this came from and why? And, and turns out we both had a lot of very similar synchronicities happening. It's those shouldn't be dismissed. They should be paid attention to and elevated as something well, important. Even, even the Russia-Ukraine war. So I published an anthology about us being at war with the Russians that came out in 2020. And there's another story I wrote called Swarm. If you go to Vice Media, it's on there. It's like 1,200 words. It's about a U.S. Special Forces team in Ukraine fighting Russians. And if you look at that hmm. recent data leak, we had about 100 special forces in Ukraine doing who knows what since the beginning. So yeah. And anyway, I didn't mean to get, get off track. So how do you think this thing That's not off track. This is very much part of But this is about you. This is not about me. Like people don't no, watch well, this to watch me. They watch we're, they're here to watch we're, you. We're we're bouncing off each other because we're talking about the same experience you and I have both had with yeah. precognitive mind's mostly dream state. I've had a few conscious precognitive moments, a few recently. But no, it's very much related to this. It's related to remote viewing. It's related to the future influencing the past. That's what my three books are about, for God's sake. It's what this theory is about, is interacting across time, whether it's us individually with our own consciousness or the whole of humanity. It's extremely relevant. So do you think this kind of cataclysm narrative is driving this, or do you think this is this bifurcation you're talking about? This, <clears throat> I mean, to add the to, the, to the bifurcation thing, because I went too negative. I want to go positive now. I also interviewed Chris Bledsoe. And if you take everything out of that interview, the one core message that he related over and over, are you familiar with his whole I experience? I was on a panel with him a couple of years ago, and he he's a contactee, abductee, just had a book come out recently, right? Yeah. So he's, again, this is the 2026, 2027 narrative. So this entity that he calls the lady, I think based on just my research, which is, you know, again, just interviews, I think is associated with is the same entity as the, the Catholic church would say it's the Virgin Mary at the miracle at Fatima. But I think it's the same entity, whatever that entity is, that was present at Fatima, right? You could call it future humans. You could call it light beings you call it angels you could call it I, I don't know and and all of those i would call it all of those yeah it could be all of the above but one of the prophecies that the lady and by the way like he's not some guy who just fell off the turnip truck and said i had a vision right he started predicting things that started happening and the government the dia cia 
Department of Homeland Security was on him like white on rice for 15 years to try to clamp him down and and like talk to the the broader world. But if there was one takeaway from my interview with him is think positively because there's this again, who knows what the nature of reality is, but we, in some sense, nudge quantum mechanics. Everything's a probability distribution. Everything's a wave, right? So while you and I can't just say, you know what? I want to play in the NBA tomorrow, right? So can I manifest that? Sure. You might be able to increase your probability from one in 10 billion to one in 1 billion, but you still ain't going to play for the NBA tomorrow, right? But I think- Not tomorrow, but if you did have- access to precognitive information and sent that back to yourself as a young child with the aim of doing that. And it eventually happens to the extent that you do become that and send it back. And then it could, but no, saying, I want to do this tomorrow, that's unrealistic in the context of what we're talking about even. Yeah. So I think, again, the key takeaway is just be positive, think positive thoughts. That doesn't mean you're going to survive what's coming. But it might not come if you're yeah, if you think positively. exactly you manifest an alternative outcome. Yeah. And I think you're, you're going to like this last book. It's about all of these things that we're talking about. And yeah, that's the main theme is that we're on the brink. It's a peri apocalyptic setting. You know, we're right on the verge of this. There's all this political turmoil. There's a lot of religious zealots that are, you know, manipulating. When did you write swaths of the population? It just came out last month. Okay. All right. But but when did you write it though? You I mean you it, you probably wrote it long wrote, before that. Not really. No, I had the idea for it nine months, almost to the day before it was published. My first book took seven years. My second book took three years. This one took nine months from conception to publication, which kind of blew my mind in the process. But yeah, so it's about that idea. Can we avert this? Should we avert this? What's the implication if we do one or the other? Is humanity better off? Which group of humans are better off? And yeah, I I totally agree with Bledsoe there that we could still avert this. Seemingly, we're not going to because nobody's even paying attention to what's happening with one of the biggest things in the history of, of at least recent humanity. Nobody's even paying attention to it. So how do we get out ahead of that? How do we modify our collective consciousness to avert a disaster that may be needed for the future of our species? Not saying it is, but if we are going to avert it in this Bledsoe-esque capacity, I don't see that happening. So this will sound tremendously self-serving, but I'm just going to say it anyway. We could be in a reality where those of us who are paying attention to all this might be the ones who survive. Because we don't freak yep. out when a flying saucer shows up behind your house when the earth's shaking. And you walk toward you know, we it. Don't, we, yeah, we walk toward it. We don't run away from it. And, you know, frankly, you know, and you, we don't even know if we walk toward it. it might, you know, things will be better or we get thrown into an incinerator. Who knows? But I would probably walk toward it in that situation. I would probably bring my kids toward it too. But if you're not habituated to, not habitu- habituated is not the right word, but if you haven't, at least gotten right with the idea of it. Now, if you see something you've never seen before, you're going to be afraid. You're going to freak out. I don't care who you are. If you see something you've never seen before, you're especially reptilian. if you think it's the devil. If, the, if you think it's the devil trying to, well, lead I'm you saying away like you God. and I, if we saw something like that, right? Even knowing what we know, we still might be like no. there's still. No, I think there's think a hard afraid? line in the sand with, no, not at all. Not, not at all. No, I was mostly circling back to what my old man said when I interviewed him, because you do have this group of people who see the UFO phenomenon as the devil's work. There's even supposedly this group in Congress. I can not remember the name of them. You probably know the what Collins I'm talking Al- about. Co- well, I don't, I don't Collins know what they're in Congress. Yeah, yeah that's Collins the Nick Elite, Redford. That's... Yeah. Yeah, so that's not a one-off example. You know, there's a lot of people in the global population. And and yeah, I don't mean to keep bringing it back to this book, but everything you're talking about is exactly what that book's about, you know, where you have these people that are paid attention. These people are more open-minded, people that are nice, 
you know, who, who don't just have a mouth full of scripture and a heart full of hate that are actually people that you would want. Yeah, well, to Michael, start I'm not nice. Population. I'm not nice, but I am open minded. Yeah. And even that <laughs> alone, you know, and, and, and acceptance of science and acceptance of, yeah. you know, what we can learn from the world and a, a spiritual side, maybe, you know, versus just stuck in a little bubble where you're you're just spewing hate in all directions you know maybe there is a line there i'm not saying there is that's why it's written as science fiction and satire but it echoes exactly what you've been saying so one thing that lynn buchanan did say that on the back end of this and the same thing that chris bledsoe said is that on the back end of this chris bledsoe said it's kind of the you know millennium of peace after whatever this unveiling event is again i'm just going to say it and then you can decide what to do with it but what he was told is when the red star regulus aligns at sunrise with the eyes of the sphinx there will be a new knowledge that's it so i think he went and checked to see when that actual alignment happened and in my interview he told me september 23rd 2026 was when his you know astronomer astrologist friends told him that would be but in a subsequent hmm. interview on the jeff mara podcast he said it was easter 2026 so i don't know i don't know if he had like initially gotten wrong information because the Mar jeff mara podcast was after mine so i don't know when the exact date is i would have to verify myself well easter but, sounds a lot cooler and he's he's a religious person too isn't he yes but he i wouldn't i think he grew up as a baptist but he's not a baptist anymore given exactly what you're talking about when he started yeah, talking right. about these visions they're like you know you're you're with the devil and all this kind of stuff rather than yeah well let's it's first isolating. figure out what this is like look i don't think you should assume that everything is happy and nice and you know there are positive and negative entities and i think you need to be discerning when you kind of look into all this kind of stuff but absolutely i think I think what he's seeing, and based on the the evidence, I think what he's seeing is a very positive thing. Yeah, so, that's anyway. good. And even you know, even positive versus negative, good versus evil, those are very nuanced questions, and it oftentimes depends which side you're on and what the context of those things are. So, and you yeah, wouldn't no, I totally recognize agree. you wouldn't recognize one without the other. You need the right. other to recognize. So. Yeah, it's yin and yang right. for sure. I want to make sure you. You don't miss your meeting. So I could talk to you for hours about this. Yeah, this has been fun. Forth. I've enjoyed so it. I appreciate your time, my friend. And I would, you definitely, we'll definitely have you on again when you have more time because I thought this was fascinating. So, yeah, for sure. Look forward to that. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, my friend. Thank you, Sean. Good talking to you. If you enjoyed this video, please click on like, subscribe, and the notification button so that you're alerted anytime I post something new. Oh,